What's up, guys? How you doing? Welcome back to another episode of I Am Kenny Biddle. I happen to be your bartender today, Kenny Biddle. That's right. Uh, instead of being stuck in our office, in my office, you guys being stuck in my office, I decided to come outside into Tiki Land, which is in my backyard. This is where all the parties happen. Um, much more relaxed environment, and there's beer out here, so why not? Uh, not too long ago, I posted up on the Facebook page asking people to send in questions, and they did. A few of them I can actually read because uh, I didn't make it clear at first that they were supposed to be paranormal related, and then Bobby Tingle and Lou Castile, you know, they jumped in with some questions that I can't repeat here. Anyway, I did get some good questions, and I'm going to answer them now. We're going to go through them. I have my notes. I have a few props, and let's just jump into them. Greg O'Brien, what's up, buddy? He sends in a uh, question saying, when are you reprinting your orb book? Wow, uh, I have honestly no idea. Um, this is what he's referring to. Uh, back in 2007, I published Orbs or Dust, a practical guide to false positive evidence. It's a pretty cool book, I think. It's got a lot of uh, explanations in there and experiments on how to figure out how all these paranormal pictures are getting captured, you know, how people are getting them. But again, it came out in 2007, so that's eight years ago. There's a lot I learned since then. There's a lot more that's come out. Um, phone apps, holy shit, you know, that stuff wasn't out in 2007. The ghost phone apps, where you can, you know, go on a ghost tour and take a picture of a historical building and put a ghost in there and convince the tour that you actually had a ghost. Hmm. But stuff like that. There's a lot of technical background on photography and video that I learned and I gained experience in, so I want to put that in. And I want to make sure that I'm not being too technical, that I lose people. I want to put it in simple language and, you know, work on it. I've been working on it in between other projects, so it's not something that I'm focused on, which I'd really like to be, but I'm not, because there's a lot more, a lot other projects that I'm working on. Um, in the meantime, so whenever I have time, I sit down, start working on it, and I get maybe like a page or two done at a time. So it, it is in the works. I have no idea when it's going to be out, um, but I promise when it's done and finished, I will send you, Greg O'Brien, the first copy. Okay? That's my promise. Hold me to it. All right? Okay, next question is from my good buddy, Mitch Silverstein. He asks, is it really possible to change the overwhelmingly strong blind belief system that is the majority method in the car current para community? Can't talk, it's good beer. Wow, is it, is it possible to change the overwhelmingly strong blind belief system, which is the majority? No, not, not the majority, not by any means. Um, since the, the TV shows, the whole power TV thing with the ghost hunting unreality TV shows that, come, that came out, it's just like across the board, people just bought into it so deeply that I pretty much equate the paranormal community with a religion. Uh, it, it has become pretty much a religion for a lot of these groups and individuals. It's become a way of life. Uh, they depend on their beliefs in this which in turn dictates how they go about doing their investigations, their ghost hunts, how they go about doing lectures and talking to people and, and passing on what they believe is evidence, which is not. Um, but uh, yeah, I think it's, it's so ingrained now that you're not going to change the majority of people. Uh, blind belief is a strong belief. It's, it's basically a religious belief. I know I keep repeating that, but that's the way I see it. Um, I'm looking up my notes again, because uh, religious notes are deep-seated beliefs, which the paranormal is. I mean, how many people uh, wholeheartedly believe that demons exist? How, how many people wholeheartedly believe that whenever they go to a haunted location, that they are going to get evidence? You know, they don't, it, it's not a question of maybe they'll get something, or maybe they'll find the truth of, uh, behind the claims that are being made. No. They are definitely sure, positively, 100%. They know they're going to get evidence. And that's it, because that's based on their blind belief system. And 
and talking talking to them is, is really hard. I mean, to add to that issue is that the overabundance of pseudoscientific groups and individuals constantly spreading all this misinformation out there. You, you have, I mean, some of them do it for profit. A lot of them do it for profit. You have useless equipment, you know, designed specifically for ghost hunters. You know, that don't do nothing. Don't, don't do nothing. That's my Philly accent coming out. <laughs> but you, have, you have these devices that light up, they make noise, but they, they, they read basic things like uh, um, E-fields or uh, electromagnetic fields, but there's nothing that links them to ghost hunting at all. So these guys are using it because they saw it on TV and because somebody popular on TV used it, they think it's legitimate. So, and, and a lot of these TV shows are claiming to be scientific when they're completely not. But that just filters down. You know, that, that's the shit rolls downhill kind of idea because the popular people up here are using it on TV and it rolls down to all the viewers. And they see it, they want to use it. Um, you have a misuse of terminology. I mean, oh shit, how many times do you hear the word energy? And it's used like, I, I walked into a room and I felt the negative energy in the in there, or the positive energy, or I'm going to do healing energy. No, no, that that basic term is so misused. They have no idea of the definition of energy, and it's energy is basically the the ability to do work. As in, if I eat food, food gives me energy to do stuff. Okay, I can work. I can haul firewood from out front to the back rack here, and. I can, I can work all day or go to martial arts training, you know, because I ate some food, I drank water, I drank Gatorade, that all gives me energy, replenishes me. You know, going into a room and saying I feel negative energy doesn't make fucking sense at all. You have uh, completely made up theories. That goes right in line with the pseudoscience. You know, the, the ghost hunters and paranormal enthusiasts don't understand the, the difference between a theory and a hypothesis. They don't get it. They use the terms interchangeably, interchangeably. Therefore, they misuse them, and that's why the science community treats them as a joke because they don't use the right words. Um, what else do I got? Uh, on the other side, on the other side, I, even though you can't change the majority of of paranormal enthusiasts. I think there is a large percentage that are not so blind. They don't fall into that category of blind belief. They are there, they saw, they see what's on television, they see what other groups are doing, and they're following along until they hear something better. Because they're not sure, that's the norm, so they're following it. So when somebody else comes along, like for me, like me, or Mitch, or um, Carolyn, or Anna, or any of us, you know, any of us skeptical people that are out there, they come along and we, we sit down and we have a serious, polite, professional discussion with them and explain our ways and explain how we see it and even demonstrate it. These are the people that are willing to change their mind. And they go f from that point on with a new understanding, a better understanding, and they're not so blind to what's going on. They don't hold them beliefs in a high regard now. Um, so I, I think yeah, to answer your question, it's not possible to change the overwhelmingly um, strong belief, which is the majority, but you can change quite a few, I think. I hope that answered your question. If not, you know, I'll do a follow-up video. All right. <laughs> Next question. Let's see. This is from Lisa Ferguson. I hope I say that right, because you spell your name L-I-S-E. I'm not sure if it's Lisa or Lise. I apologize in advance, or that wouldn't be advanced, that would be after. Anyway, you ask, the story on how you got into this field is interesting. You were on the other side at one time. That's fun. Um, I'm not sure what you mean by the other side, because the other side, in quotes, that's what it is here, uh, could mean I was a ghost hunter, which I was. When I started out in this uh, hobby, I was a ghost hunter. and. Uh, it, it was pretty cool. I mean, I was part of a ghost hunting team. I thought everything was, you know, a ghost. I thought orbs were real. <laughs> I know, I know. Can you believe it? Uh, I thought um, ecto and, and streaks and all this stuff was real. Um, 
so I, I jumped onto it, but then I started questioning it. So the more I questioned, the more I got into photography, and the more I learned, the more I understood that I was doing everything so wrong. Um, but again, uh, if you, going back to your question, if you mean the other side, I was in a, a, a little documentary that a couple friends of mine did that called, called, it was called The Other Side. And I know I was in there, and I was still on the skeptical side, so I, I don't remember what I did in that. <laughs> I haven't watched that in years. Uh, but basically, I guess, how I got into this field. I guess that, that what sparked my interest in the paranormal was that when I was about seven or eight years old, my grandmother died. And I remember going to the house, my father took me there. I don't remember if I was aware of it, aware of it or not, if I knew that she had died, or I don't, I don't remember anything except the moment I walked into the house and the house was filled with people, a whole bunch of people, I had no idea who they were. My dad grabbed my hand, started pulling me upstairs. We got up to the top of the stairs and I freaked out because I knew at the top of the stairs, the first bedroom was where my grandmother was and she had been in a, a bedroom for as, quite some time that I remember. Um, again, I was like seven or eight years old and that's, that's like, <clears throat> 30 years ago <laughs> or more um, but I remember freaking out not wanting to go into that room I grabbed onto the banister and my father tried to pry me off and he couldn't because I was I had a death grip on it and to this day I don't know why I was scared because it was just one of those traumatic events for a kid so I don't know if you know if there was a paranormal event there or if I just knew that she was she had passed away and was afraid that she was still in that room, which she wasn't, but I didn't know that at the time. So, but uh, <coughs> overall, that was how I got interested. Um, again, I was a ghost hunter when I started actually looking into uh, claims of paranormal activity. And uh, yeah, the rest is history. I mean, I'm <laughs> not really history, nobody cares. Um, but the more I learned, the more I came over to the skeptical side because the more good information I got, the more I understood that what I was doing before with all this equipment and ideas that I called theories and, you know, speculation, I thought it was all fact and then found out that it wasn't. It was, that was it, speculation and ideas and nothing supported by actual evidence. So here I am making videos about, um, a skeptical approach and critical thinking approach to paranormal. <sighs> okay, our next question is again from Lisa. She sent in a bunch, so I'm going to go through all of them. Uh, she asks, "What do you think happens after we die?" Well, my my quick answer is that they have a funeral. Your family and friends have a funeral for you, they have a little party, a little memorial thing, and then they split up all your shit. Um, <laughs> your toys and your um, furniture and your house and all that stuff gets all split up and gone. But I'm pretty sure that's not what, you're, what, what you meant when you asked this. So I'll try and be serious. Uh, I don't know. I honestly don't know what happens. Um, I have no idea. If you go by all the religions, they have all their own ideas about what happens. Um, I have no idea. All I know is, is I was an emergency medical technician for about seven years. I've seen a lot of people pass away. And I've been there in their last moments trying to save them, but they've gone anyway. Uh, what do I think happens? I think you close your eyes, you go to sleep, and that's it. If you want me to speculate, sure, I'll speculate. I would think, and I would hope, because this would be pretty cool. If you, when you die, you know, this is more like a vehicle. That'd be awesome. And you just pop out, and you look like, I don't know, like an invisible kind of smoky stingray. And you're floating through space. And you leave the planet, and you go around, you know, the solar system, you hang around the planets, you go see Pluto, you know, because that's been in the news recently. and you just go around, you find other civilizations out there. And, you know, eventually you decide, 
hey, I like this one, I want to experience this one, I was human before, let me, let me be, I don't know, reptilian, <laughs> or something like that. So, boom, you get sucked into a little tiny sperm, and <laughs> yeah, you, you go through that whole process. I won't get into the whole sexual reproduction process here, because Lou will get excited. Um, but then, boom, you're born into another race, and you experience that for a lifetime. That would be my ideal situation. That, that you know, when we die, that's what happens. Okay. Next question. Uh, what are some of your favorite websites? Hmm. Well, I think the first one is obvious. It's Google. You know, because you can find anything with Google. It's a household uh, term now. Google it. You know, and and some people, when you ask about people, you know, you want to more know more about them. They actually ask you or tell you, hey, Google me, and then. You Google them and it backfires on them. But anyway, um, other than that, the last month or so, it's actually been Skeptoid.com. That's been one of my favorite websites because it's a podcast, started as a podcast by a science writer uh, named Brian Dunning. And he tackles all kinds of subjects, not just paranormal, but goes into like history and uh, rumors and mythology and stuff like that, like was there a female pope, um, the big trash uh, island that's supposed to be in the Pacific Ocean, uh, what else, uh, floating coffins, uh, ghosts, hypnosis, a chiropractor, all this stuff. He goes into everything and he researches everything and he does really good and one of the real cool things about it is that he actually started doing episodes where he reports on mistakes that he made when people write in that are actually professionals in related fields that he talked about and minor mistakes or even major mistakes, he tells you up front, like, look, in episode so-and-so, I screwed up, this is what I should have said, and explains it in detail, which is really cool. I like that. I respect that about him. Um, but it's been fun. If you, if you work in an office or an environment where you can listen to podcasts or music, I mean, that's what I do. I've been listening to probably like 10 to 15 podcasts from Skeptoid.com every day, because I'm catching up. There's like almost 500 episodes. Uh, what else? Comicbook.com, also my, it's a good good website because it's my go-to for my comic book related stuff, because of, um, you know, free plug here. I also do a podcast called Geeks and Ghosts with my good buddy, the mighty Mexican, Lou Castile. And uh, we talk about comics and science and science fiction, and movies and, kinds of stuff. So I go there frequently and see what's going on in the Comic-Con world and uh, comic books and movies and all that kind of stuff. Doubtfulnews.com by my friend Sharon Hill. Love that because it's it's like strange stuff, you know, it's, it's strange news in the news. So it's not just your fringe shit that you have to go buy like a, the New Age magazines at the supermarket. She actually combs all the news agencies and picks out all these weird stories. You know, ghosts or loud sounds or creatures that wash up on the beach and, and stuff like that. And then she applies some critical thinking and science to it and gives you all the information that you need in short little bursts, which is nice. It's not a long, you know, 27 page report. It's like one or two pages real quick, gives you the, the sensible stuff along with the strange stuff and you're better for it. I learned a lot from her. Uh, and that's that's pretty much it for my favorite websites. I mean, I go to Facebook a lot. I'm always on there. And if you watch the videos, if you follow my blog, you know that because I'm always on there. And uh, yeah, so those are my favorite. Uh, next question. Hmm. Let's see. Again, it's Lisa. Surprise. Uh, do you think the paranormal community is increasing or decreasing? What societal factors influence this? Oh, that's a good one. When I need another drink. All right, I think it's decreasing. I think the community had a boom when the show Ghost Hunters started, um, when they first aired, uh, followed by, you know, the dozens and dozens of other piece of shit uh, para shows that have followed it since. Um, but I think the net networks over the years are, are they're showing how ridiculous these shows are. They're really showing. I mean, the last couple of shows like Ghost Asylum and uh, Ghost Stalkers, they were shitty, horrible shows, you know? And it really showed 
how unscientific, how silly, how, I guess, imaginative and, and, and made up a lot of the shit is. So I think people are seeing that and they're getting less and less interested in these shows. At least I hope so. Um, the gadgets being used as standard equipment have progressively become sillier, just like the TV shows. I mean, you, you have, you have uh, equipment now that you turn it on and it picks up maybe EMF and all it does is light up and it makes noise and that's it. It doesn't record how strong the field was. It doesn't record how long the duration of it. It has no data logging uh, capability. It's just fancy equipment. It blinks. You know, and it almost, I don't mean to be insulting, but it almost is like the people that make this equipment are treating ghost hunters like um, pets, you know, dogs and cats. Because as long as it has a blinking light or a noise maker, it'll keep you busy. You know, it'll keep you entertained for a couple hours. And they sell this shit for like, you know, 50, 100, 150 dollars or more. It's ridiculous because you guys are spending money on this shit. Oh, and it doesn't it doesn't do anything it doesn't really do what it's claimed at least the, the equipment that I've tested so far and I've seen in action doesn't do what the manufacturer claims it does except for the basic stuff like if it says it detects static electricity that's exactly what it does um, I'm getting off topic here let me get back um, the reasoning behind using uh, being used to justify what they consider evidence in the community um, has become sillier. It's all become sillier. Uh, I, I think people are seeing that they're more informed because, ah, oh, that bird's loud. Shut up. Anyway, the, the equipment being used, oh, wow. That, I think they're fighting. Anyway, the equipment being used is, uh, you can look it up now. You can look up the information about it. What can it really do? You can look up dozens of videos on YouTube and see if, if people are using it and if it works or not. So I guess the bottom line is people that are open and want to learn, they're learning more. And they're applying what they learn. That they have a better understanding of what's going on. So the popularity that, um, that the paranormal community had like years ago is dwindling. It's not rising anymore. It's actually it leveled off, I think, for a while, and it's actually going down because people are, it, it's, it was a fad, and it's starting to go down a little bit. Um, and, and that's it. I think it's slowly fading uh, more and more. It's become almost like a mainstream, I guess. It's part of the community. You know, it was taboo like two decades ago. Then it had that boost, and now it leveled off. And I think it's going to stay there. It's probably going to go back into um, more of a fringe, you know, more on the side, and people are going to start ignoring it in the next, you know, five, ten years. Wow. Hmm. Okay, next question is again, oh my goodness, from Lisa. <laughs> uh, the whole what's the harm question. For example, if someone gets some type of comfort from psychics who relate dead people's messages. So I guess she's asking, you know, what's the harm? Um, and what, what happens is like, a, this, this comes up a lot because I don't believe in psychics. I've never met someone claiming to be psychic that could actually do what they claim to do. And I get asked this a lot, what's the harm? You know, if somebody wants to pretend to be psychic and talk to, talk to family members and stuff, they give them comfort, you know, they give the, the living and the grieving comfort and this and that. Well, first and foremost, and uh, I'll try to stay calm on this, but I think, I think, I think they have big fucking balls to pretend to talk to your family members that have passed on. I really do, because that's exactly what they're doing. You're going and paying money most of the time. Not all the time, I mean, some psychics, yeah, they do stuff for free, but most of them are charging money. And they charge a lot of money for like a 20 minute or a 30 minute session. Like $80, I think was the last one. We went to Lilydale two weeks ago. The going rate was $80 for a half hour session. So you're handing over $80 for this person to lie to you, literally lie to you, and pretend to be talking to your, your 
dead parents or dead kids or whatever and speaking for them, pretending to give you messages from them. And the messages are usually general. The specifics come because, unfortunately, it, it comes from cold reading. You know, they're asking you questions. They're making generalizations to get information out of you. And therefore, you're supplying them with all the information that they're mixing up and repeating back to you, all for $80 for a half hour. It, it pisses me off that you, anybody would think that you're consoling them. You're not, psychics, when they're doing that, they're not consoling the grieving. What they're doing is actually prolonging the grieving process. Because when someone passes that we love, we care about, we need to grieve. We need to get through it. We need to cry. We need to be upset, sometimes get angry, think about the memories and stuff like that, and then move on. That's how we heal. That's how we, we go on and keep moving in life. But if you go to a, a psychic who convinces you that they can talk to your dead loved one, that process, that grieving process, will not end. It gets prolonged because now you think, well, they can talk to them. I can still talk to my, my Aunt Betty or you know Uncle John or something like that. And you keep going and you keep spending more and more money to talk to someone to pretend to you. Um, and the messages, I mean, uh, uh, messages are usually, you know, be good, be happy, you know, do things for yourself. They're generalized, they're not specific. And, and even when they describe it, oh, I don't want I don't want to get too far into it because now I'm getting into a more detail about just psychics in general. Let me get back to the question. Um, what's the harm? Well, you also have people like Sylvia Brown, pitch, um, who told people that their loved ones were dead when they were still alive, or told people that their loved ones were alive when they were dead. I mean, do we remember Amanda Berry? Hello. That, that Sylvia Bitch Brown told the mother of Amanda Berry that her daughter was dead. And then sometime afterwards, mother died. Died thinking that her daughter was kidnapped and was killed. And it was only after the mother had died, sometime after this happened, that Amanda Berry was found alive. And what really sucks when you, whoa, take my notes. What really sucks is that when you, when you see the interviews of Amanda Berry, she tells you that she was chained in a room watching a little television, watching that episode of, of Montel Williams where Sylvia Brown told the mother, her mother, that Amanda was dead. And it just, it was heartbroken. I mean, it broke my heart watching it. This is the harm that people do. They also give medical advice. You know, psychics, and we saw this in Lilydale, where one of the psychics told somebody after they, they questioned them if they had an accident or not, they told them, stop doing the exercises they are telling you to do, and do your own exercises. And with some more questioning, more little subtle statements, he's basically telling this woman that was in the crowd to stop doing what your physical therapy, um, physical therapist and your doctor is telling you, and just do the stuff that you want to do. And that could, that, oh, the potential for that, the harm that that could do, that could fuck you up for life. Literally, it could screw you up. It could cause more problems, more medical bills, a whole lot of stuff. I, I don't, I mean, psychics should be treated as a novelty, as in like that shiny toy that's in the toy store that you pick up and you push the button and it spins around and makes lights and makes noises and you're like, <laughs> for like a minute. And then you put it down and move on. That's it. Until, until anybody that's claiming to be psychic will subject themselves to controlled scientific testing to prove their claim, sorry, they should be treated as a novelty. They can do a lot of harm. I mean, missing persons. Holy shit. If, if you go to a psychic and say, oh, my, my son, he's been missing, he went camping or, or hiking, and we haven't seen him since, we sent out search parties. What if that psychic tells you, like, I don't know, like Sylvia Brown, says, I'm sorry, I'm sorry, honey, um, your son passed away. He fell, he, he got swept away in the river, his body's gone, um, so he's dead. Now what happens? What if that guy's still alive? But the parents, because they talk to a psychic, call off the search. And, and they're never going to find him. Now he might die, or he probably will die because they called off the search. 
it's shit like that. Um, that's just one example. You can actually go um, to, to a website called whatstheharm.net slash psychics, and it lists 1,315 people that were harmed by crap psychics, by the crap that psychics do. Um, and you can read all the cases and all the details about it. As far as I'm concerned, um, even though the people are nice that are pretending to be psychic, they're nice, they're sociable, I can talk to them, I have no problem sitting down with anybody, still, they prey on fear, uncertainty, grief, ignorance, and sadly, they manipulate you for profit. And that's what it is, even if they don't realize it. Cold reading is manipulation. And that's what they're doing. They're making money off of people that are grieving. And it disgusts me. I, I, don't, I don't respect it at all. I'll still talk to you if you claim to be psychic, but I, I don't have any respect for people that do that. It's a modern day form of snake oil, as far as I'm concerned. So yeah, there's a lot of harm that they could do. And uh, I, I think they should be held responsible, especially if, they're, if it can be proven that it directly, like uh, I guess actions of of people are linked directly to what a psychic tells them, I think the psychic should be held responsible. And that's it, you know? There's an idea, licensed psychics. They should be licensed, just like any doctors or therapists or psychiatrists, they should be licensed. And then when, when something bad happens, boom, comes right back on you, you know? There you go. <sighs> Next question. Okay, this comes from my buddy Bobby Tingle. What's up? It's actually a clean question. You know, I can, I can read it to you. He asks, hold on. Do you think the various branches of quantum physics will lead to discoveries pertaining to paranormal phenomenon as the research progresses? Okay, whew, this is a good one. Um, first and foremost, I gotta say that I am by no means an authority on this. I do not have a PhD, uh, nor do I pretend to have a PhD, like some people. Um, I know nothing about quantum physics, except that it's a science. Um, what I did find is that, I'm going to read this off to you because I'm not that smart. Physics is the natural science that involves the study of matter and its motion through space and time, along with related concepts such as energy and force. Okay. Now, to keep going with that. Um, Quantum physics is a branch of physics. There's other, uh, other branches include acoustics, astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, cryogenics, particle physics, thermodyna thermodynamics, I can't talk, and so on. So quantum physics is actually a, a subcategory of physics. Um, it's a branch of physics that deals with things on the atomic and subatomic levels like Ant-Man. <laughs> it explains how energy and matter behave through the use of mathematical formulas which describe particle and wave behavior. There's also quantum electrodynamics, quantum optics, and quantum gravity. So that's a lot. Um, there's a lot of science going on, a lot of research going on. Do I think uh, quantum physics is going to lead to discoveries pertaining to paranormal phenomenon? I have no freaking clue. None. Um, but what I was able to read up on this, um, the different sciences and what they're looking at, it has nothing to do with the current idea of paranormal phenomena. Nothing at all. Um, it doesn't deal with ghosts or af the afterlife or other entities like demons and angels. Um, it doesn't deal with anything like that. Uh, unless there's you know, now you, you started getting into, because people I know, they jump into string theory and stuff like that, other dimensions, um, dimensional shifts and shit like that. It's all speculation. It's all pretty much, from what I've seen, those kind of ideas as it pertains to paranormal is cherry picking. You know, they're picking little phrases here and there. You know, what sounds good, like dimensional shifts sound good. You know, the other dimensions having a, like 12 or how many, I don't know how many dimensions we're up to with string theory. Um, but saying, oh, well, there's different dimensions. And they're right next to each other, just a different frequency. Um, we don't know that. It, it's, even though it comes into string theory or um, uh, quantum theory or what, whatever they, it falls under, again, I'm not a PhD in this, um, nothing says it's concrete. 
it's still theoretical. So they're theorizing about it. They don't know if it's true yet. Don't they know I'm filming? Anyway, uh, altogether I counted at least 35 uh, branches of physics. Um, I hope you can hear me over the chainsaw, or the, no, the, uh, the weed whacker. Uh, but again, my opinion, I don't see any anything coming from it. But that's just based on, on um, simple reading. You know, reading over articles and, and descriptions and just ideas that are thrown out there in the scientific community. There's nothing that pertains to the paranormal community. Um, except for when the paranormal community starts cherry picking stuff. Um, that's all I can give you. Sorry, Bobby. I, I, I wish I could give you a better answer, but I can't. Okay. Okay, next question comes from Julie Newport. What's up, Julie? Uh, she asked for a review of the Echo Box app on Android and uh, iOS. Uh, that would be interesting. Okay, so, oh, yeah. this was a pain in the ass. This, I mean, not your question, but going over this thing, wow. Uh, from the iTunes site, quote, EchoVox is a real-time amplified recording system used to create a bed of random chaotic noise using random phonetics, microphone input, and a natural loop recording echo. Wow. Okay. Um, yeah, your, your keywords here are amplified and random. Used twice in the, in the description here. Um, your random chaotic noise and random phonetics. It has this, basically what it's telling you is that it has the chaotic noise, random phonetics, microphone input, which means it's got a microphone and it's recording the sounds in the area. And it's also adding a recording echo, like a loop, a natural loop recording echo. I'm not even sure what that means. Um, but it's adding four inputs and it's basically putting it in a bowl, mixing it up, dumping it on your recorder and saying, here you go. You know, this is legit evidence. What? Oh, all right, moving on. Uh, another quote, and this is from the same site. Echo has been shown to contribute to EVP, electronic voice phenomenon. Really? I spent, I spent several hours uh, searching for any kind of data, any kind of experiments, legitimate experiments. Let me clarify that. Not the bullshit you see from like ghost hunting teams that just turn it on and accept whatever comes out. I'm talking legitimately controlled experiments with valid results. Um, nothing. There was nothing in there. So I don't know how they can make a statement that it contributes to electronic voice phenomenon because there is no supporting evidence for this. So as far as I'm concerned, this is just bullshit. Really? They got to start doing that shit again? Ugh. Assholes. Anyway, uh, what else? Another quote is, theory. This is the result of hours of experiments in the field. It is still a work in progress. The echo is actually a chaotic loop of your recorded voice, the chopped up vocal samples and environmental sounds, a virtual soup of sound and frequencies impossible to predict, end quote. No fucking shit. Seriously, I'm sorry I'm cursing a lot on this video because, I mean, these questions are good, but what I'm finding is pissing me off. I mean, it, it, he tells you it's still a work in progress, yet he's charging $20 to download this. $20? What the, what the hell? It's a mesh of sounds. It's all together. It, it, of course you can't um, predict it because it's a whole bunch of junk. It's like taking a whole bunch of dice, like all your, you know, for us D&D people, taking your dragon die, throwing it in a big cup, and then rolling out like five, five of the dice and saying, well, I can't predict what, what's gonna come up. Of course you can't. It's random. It's completely random. 
you're manipulating what's going on too. It's not, I mean, I, I can at least give a little bit of credit to people that simply turn on a recorder and, and sit there and ask questions and sit in the quiet and wait for something to happen. Because if something comes up, if there's a, a noise or something, we can investigate that. But with this, there's nothing you can investigate because you're just jamming a whole bunch of different shit into one one recording. You're taking sounds and you're, you're you're looping it and adding an echo and putting in phonetics, random phonetics that it's just throwing in there, you know, whenever it wants. It's garbage. It's complete garbage. Uh, what else? What else? Did, uh, da, da, da. I don't <laughs> actually wrote here. How can this possibly be accepted by any by anyone with a sliver of intelligence? <laughs> and I totally support that statement because if you have any kind of intelligence, you should trash this thing and not even give it a second thought. That, that's it. Um, oh, he had said that, well, the, the person writing this, which I'm sure is the person that invented it, um, that this is the result of hours of experiments in the field. Okay. So if you do experiments, you should be keeping track of the experiment, the method you used, the controls you used, and the results that you got, all the data from everything you did. And it should be written down, explained in detail, and published. Post it somewhere, but there isn't. There's nothing anywhere that you can find. Um, basically, it sounds like, and this is speculation on my part, it sounds like all they're doing is just turning it on, letting it do its thing, and then whatever it spits out, if it sounds, you know, like a word or an answer, it's accepted. Face value. Um, and then that becomes evidence. That's their testing. That's their experiment, which isn't an experiment. It's simply turning it on. It's no different from me turning on my fucking TV and just seeing what happens. That's, that's it. That's the perfect analogy for this thing. Um, what else? Uh, another quote. Echovox is used by Barry Fitzgerald of TV's Ghost Hunters International and Bill Murphy of TV's Fact or Faked Paranormal Files, hated that show, Chris Fleming of Psychic Kids, hated that show, and Rob Demarest, I don't know who he is, of Ghost Hunters International, hated that show too, and other leaders in the paranormal field. I don't understand how these people are leaders. Um, as far as I can see, they're, they are actors on various TV shows, um, bad TV shows, um, to boot. I mean, Ghost Hunters, it's, it's entertainment. These are all entertainment shows that really are unscientific. Um, they are pseudo-scientific. That's, that's what they are. And I mean, this, this, uh, Bill Murphy, I mean, I looked him up. He, he's a nice guy. I've talked to him in person before, but he also claims to be a scientist, and I don't see any kind of actual background in science. I see film, um, but nothing in science. Uh, what else do I have here? Uh, so I don't see how basically any of these people uh, can support the claims made by this device. I don't see them as leaders. I see them as actors. They're entertainment. And, well, I wouldn't really call them entertainers either because I don't, I don't get entertained. Um, their endorsements don't mean anything. It actually falls under something I posted the other day called the um, Appeal to Celebrity um, appeal to para celebrity endorsements, which pretty much means that um, instead of actually providing credible evidence to support the claims of your device or method or you know haunted location or whatever, you use a para celeb uh, para celebrity to endorse what it is, to say it's haunted or say this device works, um, and that's supposed to be sufficient enough. It's not. It's actually shit. Um, so it, d it doesn't matter. The, the review, the quick answer on this is that the Echovox is a useless piece of shit and don't waste your money. If you have $20 to spend and you really, really want to spend it on something, <clears throat> you can send it to me. I will take it and I will actually, I will say your name on the next video and I will advertise your site. There you go. You know what? If you want to advertise on any penny biddle instead of buying a piece of shit thing like the Echo Vox, send me the $20 instead. And I will put your, your logo and banner up on my, my uh, video at the end. Okay? There you go. That's, I think that's a better deal. I really do. Because, uh, you know, it'll be on there forever. 
and the Echo Vox will hopefully fade away to nothing. Next question. Uh, this comes from Valerie Anya. I hope I said that right. Are physical symptoms uh, paranormal or self-induced on some investigators and clients? For example, your palpitations may be from, may not be from a spirit, but may be related to the energy drinks that are consumed during the investigation. That that was a great example, and I agree. I think that most of these physical symptoms are self-induced or naturally naturally occurring. Um, Scratches are a big deal anymore. I mean, that's that's like the popular thing to have scratches on your back, you know, most of the time because that's you know it's hard to get to your places on your back. But when you're going through an, an unfamiliar environment, somebody else's house or a barn or a torque site, you can easily brush up against something. You can hit something on your back like this as you're trying to get through or pass by other people. Um, uh, I had one guy tell me that he watched an investigator had an itch on his back and he went up to a tree and actually backed up in the tree and went like this against the tree, scratched his back and then lo and behold a little bit later he's like, oh, I feel something on my back and they checked and he had a whole bunch of scratches. Well, no shit. You know, you went up against a sharp tree. Um, but stuff like that, I mean, you can scratch yourself. I've done that where I, I've been itching or um, just catch myself on something uh, and you accidentally scratch yourself and you don't notice it until like an hour later. You're like, oh, where'd I get that? I don't know. Um, shit, I've done it, I've bled. I, I've been back here working and started walking up front and noticed that I'm bleeding from a cut. Didn't notice, didn't notice until I actually saw the blood. So it can happen, it does happen. Uh, what else? Nausea, dizziness, headaches uh, can all be caused by a lack of sleep, um, stress, not eating, um, eating something bad, dehydration, allergies. These symptoms could be caused by all of this. And if you're on a ghost hunt and you haven't eaten for a while or if you had allergies, you know, you could get, um, feel dizzy. You could start feeling nauseated and you want to throw up. Um, dizziness, that's especially all these ghost hunts that happen at night. You know, you're going to like two or three in the morning. If people are overtired. Yeah, you're gonna get dizzy. Um, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't attribute that to anything paranormal. I would just, you're tired. Um, and that's it. Uh, what else? <clears throat> strange marks. Strange marks that can happen anytime prior to noticing them. Um, you can get marks. You can get bruises and stuff. And, and I know people are gonna argue. Well, you know, if I hit something, I'm gonna know it. You don't always do that. You know, if it's something that you don't, uh, some people bruise easily, some people don't. Some people can get a good shot and maybe not get a bruise until the next day. And if you see it, if you if you knock into something and you look like an hour later or two and nothing's there, you don't think anything of it. And then the next night you go to an investigation, you're in the dark most of the time, you bump into something again, it's already sore, so it hurts. And you're like, oh, that really hurt. You know what what happened, and then you turn the lights on, and you see you have a, actually have a bruise, and then for some reason we forget that we actually bumped it the day before or two days before. It happens. I'm not saying it happens every case, but yes, it does happen. We always have to look for logical explanations, natural explanations, before we just jump to the conclusion that oh, it must be a ghost because I was at a haunted site. Uh, if symptoms are caused by paranormal reasons. Uh, we haven't been able to prove it yet. That's a big thing. Um, these claims are popular on TV shows. I can't tell you how many times I've seen people say, oh, I've gotten scratched, and they lift their shirt up, and yeah, there's scratches on there. Um, what TV show What TV show hasn't had a cast member get strapped, scratched, you know, at least once? Um, or felt ill. I mean, I've seen ones where they felt so sick or claimed to have heart attack symptoms, stuff like that, but they were fine later on. and and. In most cases, I've seen them on TV where they don't seek medical attention. You know, they go back to the trailer or they go back to the, the home base and they rest for a little bit and everything's fine. You know, they're, they're good, we can go back out. I'm gonna push through it. And they do it, which they should have gone to the hospital, but no. Um, so I guess the bottom line is no, I don't think uh, any of these weird symptoms are caused by paranormal reasons. 
uh, mostly because we don't know what paranormal really is. It's a general term. You know, is it caused by a ghost? I don't know. It's up to the person claiming that they got sick because of a ghost, because of a ghost, to prove it. You know, that's where the burden of proof goes. It goes on the one making the claim. So, if you're saying that a ghost made me sick, you're going to have to prove that. I don't have to prove that it didn't make you sick. I mean, I can give you logical reasons why you were sick anyway, but it's not up to me to prove it. It's up to you. Okay, last question. And this comes from Valerie Myers. Uh, she wrote, hi, Kenny. Hi, Valerie. Uh, I've seen you mention EVPs a couple of times, but haven't read about any of your specific criticisms or ideas about their nature. What do you suppose is their cause? Thanks for your input. Well, Valerie, first and foremost, um, I, I would say my, my biggest criticism is that EVPs are not done in a controlled environment. And what I mean by controlled environment is that you are in a room that is completely controlled. All the variables that could influence your results, um, which the results would be your EVP. Wow, they just keep going, making more noise over there. Um, your results would be EVP. Your variables would be like an open window, people on the street, their voices carrying through that window, an open door, vents that would lead to other floors where other people are. Um, these are all variables that can have an influence on your end result. So you have to control them. Um, and, and you don't see that. You see, rather, groups putting their, their recorders down, like these, putting them down somewhere or holding them in a room and they're asking questions. There's other people in there. Um, they don't account for noises outside. They don't, except when they, they, they tag them, which is when they hear a voice or hear a noise, they usually say, I heard a noise outside, and that's it, that's tagging. Um, but otherwise, the other controls are not in place. So you have all these random noises, and as I mentioned, they tag when they hear the noise, but if they don't hear the noise, then it's not tagged, and it, it can easily become an unknown or unexplained noise. Um, so that's my, my biggest concern, is that they're not controlled environments. So you could have random noises from anywhere, from any source, getting onto that recording. Um, another concern is that most recorders are like these. They're compact with the microphone built into the case. So if you're holding this, any, any movement on your part, your fingers, your thumb going around, it causes friction, it causes vibration through the case, which goes to the, uh, the microphone. It can actually amplify um, as it gets to the microphone, causing a noise, um, yes and no, short little words, um, yeah, uh, no, yes, or, or I, I guess little words like that are easy because just, just going like this could cause something like that. That sounds like a short word. Um, that's what you get a lot of times. In my experience, is that EVPs are short answers. You, you ask a question, are you dead? Are you here? Yeah. Or you get a noise like that? Yeah. And that short answer could easily be done by friction. Um, also, people whisper. They always say, don't whisper, don't talk. We're gonna have an EVP session, somebody's gonna ask questions, nobody else talks. Almost every time I've, I've tagged along with a group, someone has whispered. You know, they lean across and they're like, hey, what are you doing? Something like that, because they think the recorder can't pick it up. And most times, yes, it does. Or it picks up sounds from you moving. Um, uh, contraction and, uh, and expansion of items in the room because the temperature difference. You know, as you're going through the, the late night hours, things start to cool down and they start contracting. And sometimes they pop, floor creaks, um, furniture could pop, move, vibrations from the street, um, people walking around. If you walk around upstairs, you can hear it sometimes. You can also feel it. Um, if you're walking around on just an old floor, Anything on that floor, tables, um, chairs, can also be influenced by that and move slightly, making little creaking noises. Uh, what else? What else did I write down here? Oh, well, going back to the variables, people outside. 
How many times do um, groups have EVP sessions in like the main room of the house? And you don't, you, you see the inside of the house, but you don't know what's going on outside. The window that's behind one of the investigators could be to a main street. You could have a main street, like with storefronts, bars, a whole bunch of things going on on a Friday or Saturday night that could be only like 15, 20 feet <clears throat> away, from that, away from that window. So you can have all manner of people um, laughing, giggling, crying, talking, screaming, hollering, whatever out there and, and getting noises onto your recording. Uh, what else? Um, variables. Uh, even on different floors, ventilation is a big problem, especially with older houses. Um, there was a, a, a place called Selma Mansion that I, I visited that when you walk through there were holes between the floors in closets because piping went up and the pipe went up through the floor and there was probably like a gap like that big between the, the, the floor, between the pipe and the rest of the floor. So anybody up in that room talking you could hear them perfectly which would screw you up even if you were in a hallway. These are things you have to look at, you have to test. Uh, what else? What other other criticisms? Priming. Oh shit. Priming. I hate when you watch a, like a, a paranormal TV show and they're like, oh, we got this recording and it's an EVP and it says this and they tell you. And then when they put up that little like uh, that, that recording, the waveform of the recording and then they put in quotes what they think it says. So right away you read that or you hear what they tell you it says and then you listen to the recording you hear it. That's priming. They're setting you up saying, okay, this is what you're supposed to hear and you know, go figure. That's what you're going to hear. Uh, but in other times when they have a recording and they play it for people without telling them what they think, it's amazing when you find out like, oh wow, there's like three or four or five or more different answers. People don't hear the same thing. Uh, mistaken identity. You could have like, oh, this is a, a great one. Cats. I don't like cats. I'm not a cat person. I'm a dog person. But cats have this ability that they sound like a crying baby. And look on YouTube, you know, just uh, search for cats that sound like crying baby. <clears throat> You're going to find dozens of videos where a cat that's whining or whatever it's doing, it sounds like it's creepy. It sounds like a baby crying. And that's some of the reports of some of the places I've gone to. Uh, I, uh, Whispers Estate is one of the places I've been to where there was a report of a crying baby and they couldn't figure out where it was coming from. But when I went there, there was the neighbor had a cat, there was another cat in the backyard. Um, I don't know who it belonged to, but it had um, a tag. But that could be a very plausible explanation for a crying baby. Um, wow, well, there are so many things. I don't think I don't think EVP. It's just the people, people around you. You can be picking up their voices easily, but because they're not in the same room, I think the mentality is that because I was in the room by myself, that that's what you tell people. I was in the room by myself. No one else was there. And then when you question them more, you find out well there was people upstairs or downstairs or outside waiting for you, which are perfectly logical, plausible reasons for you getting a voice on your recording. Um, I think mistaken identity, I started saying that again, but uh, hearing the noises, um, hearing what sounds like a voice or whatever kind of noise, there's a game of association. It's, it's also priming. When people ask questions like, why, why are you here? Um, how did you die? Whenever you're listening to that, you're expecting an answer that relates to the question. So if people ask how did you die and you hear something that sounds like you're going to hear like heart attack. That's what you're listening for. Heart attack, fall, uh, murder, something like that. That's what you're expecting to hear. So if there's a noise that comes across that kind of, uh, kind of, a uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? Um, uh, oh crap, what's the word I'm looking for? Is, is familiar, not familiar, similar, that's the word. If it's similar to heart attack or murder, 
or stabbing or gunshot or something like that, if it's similar to it, your brain's gonna match it up and say, it sounded like it, it's close enough, that's what it said. And now you're convinced that that's what it said. Um, ghost boxes, that's part of EVP too. I'm not even gonna get into that because that's an entire, entirely different episode. Um, and I'm actually working on that with somebody else. So, I think that's it. I wanna wrap it up. Um, I hope that was good. I hope everybody likes the answers that I gave. If you have more questions, please, please feel free to send them to me because I would like to do another episode like this and more episodes every every so often where I can answer viewer questions because this was fun. I, I mean, I looked up a lot of the stuff even though I got pissed off at some of the things. It was still fun to talk about it. Uh, also got the drink um, a little bit, which I don't usually do in these videos. Uh, but, and I got that out here too. I mean, it's nice to show off Tiki Land. I love it. So, now that um, they're going to start mowing the lawn again, I'm going to wrap this up um, good. If you have any complaints or comments or hate mail or anything, please send them to my uh, complaint department. That is Louis Castile. He is in California. You can email him. And uh, if you have any topics that you would like uh, an episode on, uh, I have a whole bunch, but if you know, if you have a particular topic you want to hear about, you know, send me something, send me a message, say hey. <clears throat> What's coming up? Uh, Paranormal Expo's Journey. Paranormal, no, I screwed that one up. Paranormal, Paranormal Journeys Expo. Wow, I screwed that one up. Sorry, John. Um, that's coming up September, I want to say 25th. Um, you can look it up. It's a, it's a Paranormal Expo, a little con conference. I'm going to be speaking at it. I'm going to be talking about paranormal photography, maybe a little critical thinking, stuff like that. The weekend after, September 20-something, I forget right now because I'm outside. I don't have all my notes at my desk. I will be at the Alpha Twitch Festival. It's kind of like a, a festival. It's an apple festival that celebrates this creature, this mythical creature that's supposed to be like a tiny Bigfoot. <coughs> so it's like a little foot. Um, I'll be bo at both of those events, so if you're if you can look them up and find them, come on out, visit me, say hi, you know, talk to me. I love meeting everybody in person. Unless you absolutely hate me, then don't worry about it. And uh, that's it. All right. So have a great weekend. Have a good time. See you later.